There are a lot of people here at the church who have been woozily wandering around this week, still a little bit dazed from our strawberry festival that happened a week ago Friday. If you happen to miss it, God gave us a beautiful night, and with it, thousands of people came to our church campus, filling nearly every inch of it. I have to tell you that I didn't know most of the people who were here that night, and I'm kind of glad that I didn't. You see, before the Strawberry Festival, I was praying that God would bring to our church friends from our community, in addition to our own church members. And man, did God ever bring people to our church for Strawberry Festival. Lots and lots of them. One member said to me this week after the Strawberry Festival that she would, she's thinking about how do we love all those people because she wants to. She, she wants to love those people who came to our church that night with the love of God. And I would say it's, I would bet that almost all of us would love to see those people come back to our church, but our work is cut out for us. And I think you know that church attendance is declining in our country, and it's been declining for the last 15 to 20 years. The birth, the birth rate continues to drop, which means we'll see fewer babies coming to be baptized. That's really how Presbyterians do evangelism. They have babies. And we're having fewer babies than we did before. Many of the young families who are here for Strawberry Festival, and again, it was just so exciting to see children and youth and their families here. One of our staff members was handing out brochures for Vacation Bible School that's happening in a couple weeks. And she said that a number of times as she gave the brochure to the families and said, hey, we'd love to have your child here for Vacation Bible School, they looked at her and said, what is Vacation Bible School? What can we do to reach all of those people? Well, we already have outstanding programs in the church. We already have an incredibly gifted staff. We already have a beautiful property that you can't miss if you drive through Morristown. What can we do to reach all of those people that God brought here? Well, I'm going to take all of the chips and I'm going to push them onto one thing. I'm pushing all of those outreach chips onto us, onto you as a church. How about that? See, I think that we can reach the people of Moorestown with the love of God and with the gospel. Our scripture passage today will tell us how. I'll be reading to you from the book of Ephesians. We're preaching through the book of Ephesians right now. And today we're going to be reading from Ephesians chapter 4. You see, we're saying that Ephesians is our source book to understand God's master plan. This plan of God, which goes back to the beginning of time, it includes you, it includes me, and it includes us. This plan is about how God reaches us, but also God's uh, plan to reach the world through the church. So listen now to the word of God as it's found in Ephesians chapter 4, beginning with verse 1. Therefore, I, a prisoner for serving the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of your calling, for you have been called by God. Always be humble and gentle, Be patient with each other, making allowance for each other's fault because of your love. Make every effort to keep yourselves united in the Spirit, binding yourselves together with peace. For there is one body and one Spirit, just as you have been called to one glorious hope for the future. There is one Lord, 
one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and in all and living through all. However, he has given each one of us a special gift through the generosity of Christ. That is why the scriptures say when he, Jesus, ascended to the heights, he led a crowd of captives and gave gifts to his people. Notice that it says he ascended. This clearly means that Christ also descended to our lowly world. And the same one who descended is the same one who ascended higher than all of the heavens so that he might fill the entire universe with himself. Now, these are the gifts Christ gave to the church. The apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, and the pastors and teachers. Their responsibility is to equip God's people to do his work and build up the church, the body of Christ. This will continue until we all come to such unity in our faith and knowledge of God's Son that we will be mature in the Lord, measuring up to the full and complete standard of Christ. Then we will no longer be immature children. We won't be tossed and blown about by every wind of new teaching. We will not be influenced when people try to trick us with lies so clever they sound like the truth. Instead, we will speak the truth in love, growing in every way more and more like Christ, who is head of the body, the church. He makes the whole body fit together perfectly. As each part does its own special work, it helps other parts grow so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. Would you pray with me for the proclamation of the gospel of Jesus Christ our Lord? Would you pray that for yourself? Would you pray that for those who are listening today? Let us pray. Lord, would you do here in this church among these incredible people, what we've just read. That we might be the body of Christ as you have just described it. Lord, we know that you can do that. That's why we ask. And so we pray, Lord, for one another now as we hear the gospel. May the gospel be like medicine to our wounded souls. May it be like bread to our starving souls. Lord, may we find strength and hope and joy beyond ourselves as we hear the gospel today. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts, may they be acceptable in your sight, for you are our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Ephesians is six chapters long. For three chapters, one through three, Paul has set forth an unbelievable vision. It begins way back before the beginning of time, when before there was anything, billions of years ago, The Bible says that God knew you, God loved you, and God set his plan of salvation to reach you in love way back when. This plan comes to us not when we're at our strongest or at our best, but rather when we're at our weakest. Ephesians chapter 2 says that when you were dead in your trespasses and sin, unable to do anything for you, that's when God came and claimed you, that's when new life began for you. And then we go on to discover God's plan to bring people just like us, folks who are broken, people who are confused, folks who are just trying to find their way in the world, who get it wrong more than they get it right, people just like us. God designs to bring us together in a community called the church. Now, in God's plan, master plan, God wants to bring people together who otherwise would never be together. We're talking about people who naturally hate each other. Jews and Gentiles, black and white, Republicans and Democrats. God plans a community where people who naturally hate each other come to supernaturally love each other because of the grace, mercy, and power of God. Those are the first three chapters of the book of Ephesians. We call that message good news. 
we identify that good news message as the gospel. We get three chapters of the gospel, and then the final three chapters are what we are to do to live the gospel in this community we call the First Presbyterian Church of Morristown. And folks, there is a fair amount for us to do. Because in the last three chapters of Ephesians, you will find 36 verbs in the imperative mood. If that's more grammar than you want on a Sunday morning, a rainy Sunday morning, let me tell you what that means. 36 imperatives are not suggestions, not good ideas, not something to get to when you feel like it. No, we are commanded to do these things. If we are following Jesus as his disciples, we are commanded to do these things. And as we do these things, we'll do them imperfectly, but as we're committed to doing them, there will be created here in this place, 101 Bridgeboro Road, Morristown, New Jersey, a, a slice of the kingdom of God. See, here's God's master plan. We've heard of this amazing good news we call the gospel for three chapters. Then we get three chapters to live it because here's what God wants to do. He wants to say, folks, if you want to get an idea of what this message looks like, come to the people of First Presbyterian Church of Morristown because they're living it out. You'll see it there. In the first four centuries after Pentecost, the church grew like crazy. Children, slaves, women, all kinds of people were, went to the church in droves. Interestingly, they were doing so in the midst of pandemics, social unrest, violence, political upheaval. They were doing it in the same conditions that we're, doing, that we're faced. But people were driven to the church because I think the church got the good news of the message and they did a pretty good job of living that out. Now, after a couple centuries, and I'm talking about the, the second, third, and fourth centuries, some of the Christian leaders began writing. They did a lot of writing in those days, and there was one topic that they wrote about more than anything else. It was a virtue. It'd be fun. I won't ask for your guesses, but you'll be surprised at what they wrote about more than anything else. They did not write about love. They did not write about prayer. They did not write about how do you practice your Christian faith in the Roman Empire. No, they did not write about any of those things. None. They wrote about patience. Patience in the mind of the early church was the most important virtue for believers in Jesus to practice. Why patience? Here's why. Because those early followers of Jesus realized that God had been incredibly patient with them from the start of their faith through every day of their faith. They realized, they understood that God had been patient with them. Therefore, they were deeply committed to the practice, to the act of patience. The historical record shows this that the church grew in those days not because they won argument after argument with their non-believing friends, because they didn't. People were drawn to, to the faith, the Christian faith, because Christians practiced patience. Now patience, let me tell you, doesn't just get dropped into our lives. Many of you wish that it would, because you know you have no patience. Patience always develops in the following way. God puts you in situations, most likely relationships, that require you to develop patience, patiently, of course, over a period of time. Patience will develop within you as you seek God's help as you surround yourself with people in this church who are also trying to develop the virtue of patience. The early church and the church at Ephesus clearly and patiently practiced what Paul wrote in Ephesians 4, 
verses 1 and 2. As a prisoner of the Lord, I urge you, live a life that is worthy of the calling he has patiently extended to you. Be humble. That's a command. Be gentle. That's a command. Be patient. That's a command in an atmosphere thick with love. Now, some of this language and words, especially what I just read to you from Ephesians 4, may ring a bell for you. I hope it does. Because this is exactly what we're trying to do with our ways, our 25 ways of the week. We have established as a church, our church leaders have identified these statements as a way of trying to identify our culture with the goal of creating an atmosphere that's thick with love. The better we create such an atmosphere, the better we will minister to all of our friends from the good community of Morristown. People, let me urge you today, it's time for you to put on your big boy pants. It's time for you to put on your big girl pants. Are you familiar with the phrase? Putting on your big boy pants means time to grow up, time to be mature, time to do the hard work of continuing to love one another patiently. Put on your big boy pants because that will be required in order to form patience here in your marriage, in your family. Now, let me ask you a question because I think this will help you pursue patience. Here's my question. Hasn't God loved you patiently during the course of your life? Hasn't God continued to forgive you, instruct you, remind you, and most of all, hang in with you over every day of your life? The answer is, of course he has. Yes, he has. You know he has. Jerry Bridges, a Christian author, was right when he wrote this. Every day, every day, God patiently bears with us, with you. And every day, every day, we are tempted to become impatient with our friends, our neighbors, and our loved ones. Our faults and our failures before God are so much more serious than the petty actions of others that tend to irritate us. Is that not true? Amen. What God puts up with me is nothing in comparison with what I have to put up with others. Jerry Bridges says this, God calls us to graciously bear with the weaknesses of others, tolerating them and forgiving them, even as he has forgiven us. So Paul then goes on to talk about unity. And unity is a gift given to us by the Holy Spirit that over and over again we are told to keep. Unity is given. You, God's people, keep it. Here's the truth. Christians are terrible at being unified. We are always dividing. We are always giving up on each other. We are always throwing in the towel with each other. But what is unity? Unity in the church means coming together to form something bigger that we could only form together that we'd never be able to form on our own. Unity, it means recognizing that we're stronger together than we could ever hope to be on ourselves. It means enjoying the kind of fellowship and friendship that so many of you find here and have found here. All of that's about unity. So here's what helps us keep unity. Remember, by God's loving grace, we're all one in Christ. This passage lists seven ones, seven ones that we are given. One faith, one Lord, one baptism, one spirit, one glorious hope, one God and Father over us all. One, you get the sense that one really matters to God, and it does. Unity is a big deal to God. It's a gift. It's a witness. It's a testimony because I'm not telling you anything you don't know. We live in a world of division. Our, our nation, many would say, is as dangerously divided as it's been in 60 years. And it ain't getting better. I don't know of a place in our society where there is unity. I, I, I don't see it. Do you? God wants us to be unified as a witness that is possible by the grace of God. God cares about unity. 
Unity between races, unity politically, unity between genders and generations. Because, friends, if we get that, folks are going to stop their cars on Bridgeboro Avenue to check us out because there's no place where it happens. Remember, humility, gentleness, and tolerance, and patience, there's our word, keeps us unified. Pride, harshness, intolerance, and patience, they smash fragile unity. Remember, gossip kills unity. And this is how gossip is most commonly practiced in the church, where you will talk about somebody rather than talking to them directly. Those who are filled with the Holy Spirit and filled with the love of God, courageously, directly talk to the person that they are struggling with. How can we reach all the people who came to our church for Strawberry Festival? We create with us, among us, a culture or atmosphere that's thick with love. We stick with each other, especially those who are pains in the neck, people that we don't like here at the church, people who have hurt us, people who have offended us. The easiest thing in the world, it's the immature thing to do. It's not what you do when you got your big boy pants on. The easiest thing to do is simply to walk away from the person. That is not maturity. Put on your big girl pants and hang in with the person. Hang in with the one who has grown to be a pain in the neck. Paul then goes on to talk about gifts given. Every one of us, every one of us here today has been given a gift by the generosity of Christ. These gifts are listed as leaders. And the three people who just stood up here, they are part of God's gifts to you. But here's what you have to understand. What these people do, Wes and I, our staff, our elders, deacons, and trustees, they are to equip you to do the ministry of caring for each other in the church and reaching the community out there. Did you hear what I'm saying? That job is not up to Wes Allen. That job is not up to Stuart Spencer. That's your job, and you'll do it. You can do it. We will equip you to go and serve Christ, go and serve the community. How do we reach those people who came to Strawberry Festival? Let's keep the lights on. David Paul Tripp is an author, and he writes about uh, his wife's art gallery. So when a new exhibit, uh, when, when there's a new exhibit, it requires hours of setup, from hanging the pictures to choosing where they should go. And the last thing that takes place for an art gallery for a new exhibit is the lighting has to be just right. So often at when, after there's a new exhibit, that's up, Paul Tripp and his wife will stand outside her gallery at night with the lights on. And they'll just look at it because it always looks so beautiful. And Paul Tripp's wife typically turns off the lights and Paul wishes that she wouldn't because the painting should never be in the dark. He says, you're God's child. And we at First Presbyterian Church We're an art gallery. God's grace is on full display here. Grace means that beautiful things are being done for you and are happening within you and will happen within our church. That's the promise of Ephesians chapter 4. Let's keep the lights on. Let others see what God is doing here. May it be so. Amen.